it's time for our final panel of the day and uh, for the conference. Our final panel discussion for the day is titled After Build Back Better, What's Next? Funding, HCBS, and more. Here to moderate the discussion and introduce the panelists is UCP Public Policy Committee Chair, Jean DeSaw. Jean, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Anita. I really appreciated it. I really appreciate it. And welcome everyone to our expert panel. As Anita said, I'm Jean DeSaw. I'm a trustee on the board of National UCP, uh, chair of the policy committee, and I'm a senior partner with Healthspirian, a DC-based health policy and consulting firm. I really appreciate the substantial interest in this panel discussion, uh, investments, expansions, regulatory reforms of Medicaid HCBS programs, and long-term services and supports more generally is a critically important for the disability community, for service providers, for care workers, and most importantly, for individuals with disabilities and their families. Um, the pandemic, of course, has raised the profile of concerns in this area, but persistent issues, as we all know, existed before and will continue to be challenges in the future. Um, as a, just to level set before I introduce the panel, um, the include for those, those who may not be closely following these issues, the inclusion of a substantial amount of proposed funding for the Medicaid uh, HCBS and the Build Back Better congressional legislative efforts over the last year really raised hope across the board uh, to drive change. Uh, 400 billion over 10 years really could have been a game changer even a shift during the negotiations to lower amounts uh, still present substantial opportunities. But we are here now at something of an impasse and many questions um, exist about the future. Um, I'm gonna introduce our panel who are really gonna help us get a better understanding of what's next uh, and then we'll dive right in. We hope to leave some time at the end for questions uh, so please frame them up in chat and we will try to get to them. So on our panel, I wanna welcome Kate McSweeney who became the new president and CEO of Access this year um, after leading the group's uh, national advocacy efforts including legislative and regulatory policy and member advocacy uh, after a long career practicing law. Uh, Craig Domniak is a senior policy advisor for Congressman Steve Cohen of Tennessee. Uh, he has worked for the Congressman for a very long time um, with, and has an extensive portfolio that includes healthcare and veteran services. He has a background also working in the healthcare sector and in state government. Andrea Stace is the Director of External Affairs for Gillette's Children's Specialty Healthcare, where she focuses on advancing patient advocacy initiatives, working on federal policies for kids with complex medical conditions, rare diseases and traumatic injuries, uh, and she leads Gillette's community engagement efforts. Uh, she has worked as a Senate aide uh, for Senator Klobuchar of Minnesota and as a policy analyst for the Minnesota Medical Association. Um, so with that, I'm gonna uh, dive right in with my first question to the panelists. And this is a quick round, and then we're gonna dive in with some other questions, which is perspectives on the state of play. Um, the question I'm going to ask each of the panelists um, relates to what are your perspectives on the trajectory of the HCBS legislation that we've all been seeing in the Build Back Better bill and, and, and what we're facing now. And uh, given all the events, the prospects for more broadly financial support for HCBS and long-term services support um, in the coming year. Um, I'm going to start with Andrea uh, and see uh, what you can help our audience with. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jean. And thank you to uh, UCP for inviting me to participate. I'm really excited to be here um, and, and talk about this. This is kind of our panel, um, you know, this is kind of our bread and butter. So we love talking about this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I think when it comes to Build Back Better, it's probably not going to go anywhere. I mean, maybe Craig knows something I don't know, but um, 
you know, what's unfortunate is that a lot of the provisions in Build Back Better are extremely popular with, with most uh, Americans, including funding for HCBS. Um, unfortunately, I just don't, I don't think there's enough time for Congress to get any deal passed before the end of the year. There are so many other things that they're dealing with, you know, looking at a potential COVID relief package, which is, you know, unlikely to happen at this point, dealing with Title 42, war in Ukraine, an ongoing pandemic, and now this, you know, latest leak um, from the Supreme Court earlier this week. So I, I think it'll be challenging um, for Build Back Better to, to go anywhere, um, unfortunately, you know, despite this sort of uh, broad support for these issues. Um, thanks, Andrea. Um, Kate, I, I want to turn to you because I know you're deep into, you've been deep into the advocacy related to funding, uh, both for Build, for Build Back Better, but also for um, the PHE and for some of the ARPA funding. Um, give us a little perspective on what uh, you see in the environment in this area. I think you're on mute, Kate. Sorry, you would think after all this time, how many Zoom calls have we had? Know, over, the right? over the last two years, we have seen um, yeoman's effort by uh, Congress, by CMS, certainly HHS, um, a variety of agencies really pulling together, working together to provide resources, desperately needed resources uh, for people in our community, for providers, uh, funds that were necessary and it was quite impressive, really. They were getting bills bills through. And a lot of that was made possible because of the public health emergency. Because a lot of people don't understand that the public health emergency opens up the door to certain flexibilities in the government that uh, don't exist all the time. And so now we're coming toward the end. We've had the ninth renewal of the public health emergency. It's scheduled to end on July the 15th. You know, um, Dr. Fauci has said the pandemic is sort of just with us as it's going to be now. It's behind us, essentially. Um, certainly, there's uh, a lot of people are just ready to have it behind us. I kind of missed working at home, but that's, <laughs> that's beside the point. Um, but now we're looking at what happens if it's not renewed in July. And I think, it's, I think it would be very controversial if it were, it were to be renewed in July. And generally, the, I believe the president has to give 60 days notice of an intent, so we should know soon of, of an intent to renew or not renew. Um, one of the big things that will happen is that the federal match for uh, medical funds, the FMAP, 6.2% uh, ma uh, increase, that was permitted throughout COVID will end as of, I believe, September 30th. So at the end of the quarter in which it ends, so July 15th, the end of that quarter would be September 30th. And that's going to be, I'm not sure how problematic in the end that's going to be, how much reliance there's been on it because there was additional ARPA funding. Uh, there is money that the states are holding that they haven't spent yet. There's money in the Medicaid and SHIP Provider Relief Fund that is being still being dispersed by Health and Human Services, the um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, at HRSA at Health and Human Re Services, and James wants us to define uh, uh, acronyms, and that's one I always I always forget what it means. Um, but they're great. I mean, they've worked really hard, and I think we should hold Congress to that standard of bipartisanship of pulling together, build back better. There were things in it that would have been extremely valuable. And uh, we really wanted them and fought for them. It's a big disappointment when it didn't go through. We're now looking at the um, Better Care, Better Jobs Act, which was introduced in June of 2021, which would offer a lot of the same things. So I'm gonna go on, let you go on to Craig because he has the insights group. Craig, uh, yeah, we, we'd love to hear some of your perspectives too, being in the trenches um, and uh, because uh, it's really, and one of the questions that I have specifically uh, for you also is, you know, I've, I've been working in Medicaid a very long time and a Medicaid 
HCBS and LTSS issues. Um, and it's just, it to me was so exciting that in a giant budget bill, HCBS for Medicaid like had some currency, meaning that it became an element of the process. Um, and even though the dollar amounts shifted as we moved into different pieces of legislation, it became a, hey, we're gonna do something substantial on this set of issues. And that really has never happened before in a really meaningful way. Anyway, I'm sorry, uh, please. I just wanted to ask sort of your perspective. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Jean, um, and thank you, UCP, for inviting me here um, to share my my thoughts on on this issue. Um, I think Andrea did a really good job of kind of outlaying, you know, the the picture of where we are in Congress with her experience with Senator Klobuchar. Um, there's, as she said, there's a lot of things on the docket um, <clears throat> that need to be addressed. They're time sensitive, um, and while Build Back Better is something that um, would be lovely if it were passed because of all the things that it does. Um, as we've seen, it's it's probably a little bit too big and too ambitious to pass in the Senate. Um, and um, with the narrow majority, um, it's just difficult to get anything passed. So um, the good thing is that the committee chairs are on board with HCBS uh, proposals. Senator Murray um, has had a hearing on it and uh, is very supportive. Um, but just trying to count to 51 is, is challenging. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that if it's not in the, in the, in a build back better type piece of legislation, that something might get squeezed in and, and funding levels could get increased in appropriations, um, to address, uh, to give more support for ACBS services. Um, but it's just it's just a difficult field to play now, um, and and because it's an election year, there's longer recesses, so the members aren't working on the hill as much. They're not meeting in session as much. They're out meeting with their constituents, which is part of their job too. Um, but they're not on the hill to vote and to have committee hearings and advance the legislation. Um, so the the clock is ticking, and um, it, I, I don't know. I don't have the I can't read the tea leaves to know what uh, is going to pass, um, but as I said, the leadership seems to be on board. So hopefully, something will happen this session. Well, you know, taking a step back, um, and I'm really glad all three of you, I, I think, pointed to the 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 challenges of the legislative environment, and that on the one hand, it was really um, substantial that funding in this area took on such a strong position in the broader legislative efforts for the year in a way it never has before. On the other, we are dealing with, as Andrea said, a lot of competing priorities for Congress. And um, as both Kate and Craig noted, these budget bills and processes are really complicated and it's not as simple as, hey, let's check the box and improve home and community-based services. Um, so this is where my next set of questions I wanted to ask, you know, taking a step back, what efforts can we um, pursue to ensure a sustainable future for uh, the kinds of support, care supports that the disability community really needs um, through Medicaid, through other programs? Um, how do we ensure that high quality services um, are available? How do we ensure access? There's a lot of really, there are a lot of big questions about what kind of resources do we need and how can we efficiently use them to improve people's lives. So Andrea, I wanted to start with you because I know you spend a lot of time on quality and access issues. Yeah, and you know, for those of you on the on the webinar that are not familiar with Gillette Children's, um, we are a 60-bed hospital based in St. Paul, Minnesota. We have clinics throughout the state, um, many clinics in greater Minnesota, which, which serves um, our rural population. Um, and we see lots of kids with CP every year. I checked our stats right before I got on this call and we saw about 4,000 kids just last year with CP for various medical and surgical procedures. 
So we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we improve care for the kids um, that we serve. And we've done that in a couple ways. Um, our research department is really robust at Gillette, especially considering our size. Um, and that's because we think it's, it's incredibly important that not only are we delivering care, but we are continuously working to improve it. So one example, you know, right now um, we have a outcomes department where their whole job is to look at patient outcomes, look at the research we're doing and figure out how to translate that research to, is it a different type of surgical procedure that we're doing or do we need to change a different intervention that we're doing? Um, so that is very important to us. Um, one thing we're also doing in the research space is implementing a new initiative called family-centered research. And what that is, is we are actually going to be inviting research participants to help design a study, look at the data, figure out what actually makes a meaningful difference to them. Um, and so how can we use that to improve the care that we're, that we're providing? Um, and finally, you know, thinking about how do we make care more accessible? I think everyone on this call probably has, um, you know, been exposed to telehealth in some way, uh, shape or form, that's been huge um, in the disability space, particularly in the virtual rehab space. So at Gillette, what we do, we have occupational therapy, speech therapy, and um, uh, physical therapy. And we <coughs> offer that virtually, which we hadn't done before the pandemic. We did it like, like everyone did, um, started doing virtual just to, uh, ease of access, continue care where we could. And, you know, obviously always did virtual when it was appropriate medically. But what we found is that it's really increased access for folks, especially um, in rural parts of the state who might need to travel 200 miles to go to a, a rehab appointment. So, you know, we've been trying to think about access um, in, in multiple ways, just so that we are maintaining and improving um, improving the services that we provide to our kids and our families. Thanks, Andrea. That's really, um, it's really helpful to think about the kinds of activities that we need resources to help advance, but also it's, you know, it's not just about the money, it's about how are we, how are we doing this in the, in the most useful way possible. Um, Kate, I know that you, you and I had talked a lot about before this call, you know, your perspectives on the future of HCBS and, but also about how the pandemic has, has affected sort of everyone's perspectives about this and um, some of the challenges for direct care workers that has really come to the surface on this. I think the pandemic has really shown a spotlight on uh, how important it is that we have a really robust array of options for people, uh, you know, to give people a broad range of choices for where they get their services, how they get their services, from whom they get them, but also that we have, we're able to staff appropriately and the disability um, the direct service uh, 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 support professional crisis is very real. We've had two workshops in the past month um, that, that Access offered to um, help people in the hiring of direct support professionals. And we had to close the registration. It, it was, uh, there were so many people who wanted to participate. That is unusual um, for that kind of, because it was such a dis discreet focused workshop. Uh, but this is, it's universal, it's across the board, it's affecting all kinds of organizations who really want to be able to staff up and have difficulty. And part of the problem is salaries are low, lower than they should be. And um, the jobs aren't getting, it often don't get the respect they deserve. And that's something that we have to really elevate and, and get acknowledgement from the federal government on how important direct support professionals are in order to provide uh, quality home and community-based services. Um, thank you, Kate, really um, appreciate that. And I think you, the two of you have raised some really good um, issues in the, in this, in this space. And uh, Craig, I was wondering from your perspective, um, both on the DSP crisis, the workforce crisis, 
and sort of the need to improve uh, care delivery models for the disability community. Um, what are some of your thoughts after listening to Andrea and Kate? Thank you. Um, one of the things that Congressman Cohen and I have been work thinking and working a lot on is trying to address the workforce shortage. Um, we um, have talked with probably dozens of different organizations out there now um, about uh, potential solutions. Um, and raising the salaries is, is one of those solutions. And then having a an educated and properly trained workforce is the other solution. And neither of those really addresses, neither of those is really a good long-term fix uh, or short-term fix rather. Um, the the training takes can take years to, to properly train up individuals, especially nurses um, for long-term support care. Um, and salary, having a salary wage war, um, which some hospitals and nursing traveling agencies and, and others are seeing themselves in, um, is unsustainable under the current reimbursement models. Um, so do we raise reimbursement rates to, to help pay for those salaries? Um, there are a lot of factors involved there, um, but it is something that we are, we are thinking a lot about uh, and, and part of that addressing the workforce shortage too is just raising the minimum wage in general so that if somebody is contracted through a sub agency to provide long-term care, uh, long-term support, then they're at least earning a livable wage. Um, we can't have people relying on eight, nine, $10 an hour um, to take care of our loved ones. It's just um, not a helpful situation for, for the whole uh, industry. And, and the people who rely on that care. Um, you know, given, given that, uh, you know, sort of immediate uh, sort of uh, funding solutions seem to be slipping out of our, their grasp and, and the likelihood from a lot of sources is that um, we may not see the kind of bill we'd hoped for um, this year. Um, I, you know, I wanted Craig to jump in a little bit further with some good news uh, from your perspectives about some opportunities to help the disability community through better research at the CDC. And I know you've been really deep into this issue and I wanted to see if you would talk a little bit about that. Uh, it gives us an optimistic note. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, as uh, for those of you who have been joining all day long and, and saw Congressman Cohen, um, he touched a little bit on his Cerebral Palsy Research Program Act bill, which uh, we've introduced this year that would provide $5 million for the CDC to create its own Cerebral Palsy Research Program. Um, as you may know, um, Cerebral Palsy is the most prevalent lifelong disorder that doesn't have any dedicated federal funding for it. Um, and Congressman Cohen and I are trying, trying to fix that. We currently have two co-sponsors, um, Congressman Emanuel Cleaver from Missouri and Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania, and we're looking for more members to join on. Uh, the last two years, Congressman Cohen has led a letter to the Appropriations Committee um, to express his support <laughs> for cerebral palsy funding. He had 10 members sign on to that letter last year. And this year we doubled that number to 20. So um, we're looking to get most of those 20 onto our bill as co-sponsors so that we can show the leadership in the house that this is a priority for us um, and that uh, cerebral palsy deserves some research funding. Um, thanks, Craig. I think that's a great example of um, you know, really pursuing, I mean, recognizing a real lack in the, in the healthcare sort of administration and the federal level and really pursuing a, a specific and new and important uh, research area. Um, you know, there's a lot of activity going on behind the scenes that aren't part of the big legislative efforts per se. And I wanted to ask Kate to talk a little also about what's going on behind the scenes with home and community-based services. Uh, touching on the HCBS settings rule, which is sort of a new piece of regulation that will govern how um, sort of providers in this area operate. Um, 
but it also can create some interesting opportunities for um, improvement in the overall care ecosystem. So Kate, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about that. Can I, can I return to two things? Oh, I wanted to do two plugs. One, oh, um, sure. Congressman Cohen has a great newsletter that comes out every week. I just wanted to plug that because I, I read it every week. I don't know how I got on the mailing list, but I always, I always get something from it. And two, UCP and Anchor um, did their Case for Inclusion 2022 report which is really worth reading. And uh, with respect to direct support professionals, I just wanted to point out that their report showed a 43 point, your report, I should say, showed a 43.8% turnover rate among DSPs during 2020, which is pretty massive and a, a, a real place to tackle. Um, in respect to home and community-based services, the actual, there's a, in 2014, before I actually joined Access, when I was still in private practice, um, CMS issued uh, what is commonly just called the final rule, which oh, sounds so desperate. You know, it's a, it's a little frightening, intimidating, and it actually um, had a five-year window. The purpose of the final rule was to really look at um, institutional settings. What were institutional settings? What aren't institutional settings? It didn't bar congregate settings, but it really was looking at uh, settings that where people had ample amounts of opportunity to be engaged in the world around them, to um, enter into competitive employment, um, be participate in their communities, meet people, see people, live, in, in, live independently. And it had a five-year window, which was, um, because this is all happening at the state level. Uh, and Tennessee was one of the, I think was the first one that got its state transition plan. And if I'm remembering correctly, because I remember reading all of the state transition plans as they came in, but it's a five-year process. And there was an intention that they would be, that the states would be fully in compliance in 2019, in March of 2019. And then that got delayed. There was an extension granted and it was, um, and I'm gonna actually just check my note here so that I'm not incorrect. I think it was, it was extended to 20, 2020, 2021, 2020. Then it got extended to 20, in July of 2020, it got extended to um, March of 2023 because of COVID. But nobody's expecting there to be any more extensions. So in, a, in essence, um, the final rule uh, really looks at where are people getting their, community, their home and community-based services? Is it in a place that is going to meet the standard, the HCBS standard, in order for Medi for the, to receive Medicaid funding? It's all about it's all about uh, that piece, and then for settings that uh, were there was a, a heightened scrutiny given to settings that had a suggestion that they were institutions. So some of those heightened scrutiny um, reviews were done during COVID virtually. A lot of them were done in person, but that deadline is going to be March seventeenth of twenty twenty three. Uh, for the states to be in compliance. And it will affect Medicaid funding if they're not in compliance. So um, I am uh, curious to hear what Craig said, if he's hearing anything about an extension, because we're certainly not hearing about it, any, any further extensions. Um, thank you, Kate. I mean, again, there's a lot of, oh, sorry, go ahead, Craig. Well, yeah, Kate. Um... I haven't. I haven't heard, but that doesn't mean there hasn't been. Um, it's, <laughs> as you as you know, there's there's so much coming at you um, at any given moment oh, in healthcare. So um, don't don't let my uh, ignorance make you think that it's not happening. But I, I just don't know. Um, well, I'll I'll give my last question, and then we'll turn to the audience for Andrea. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you sort of a broad question about. Uh, providers of services that address the needs of people with disabilities, 
you know, interesting trends you see, what's going on in the state, sort of like big picture, what would you like to share with the audience about sort of what's going on in that sector? Sure, yeah, I think, um, Kate, you reminded me that I wanted to talk about this earlier when you were talking about work going on in the states. Um, you know, as we talked earlier about kind of the fate of HCBS funding on the federal level and what might happen, um, what I think is really interesting and could be a good approach for, for folks in this group to consider is what can be done at a state level um, to improve delivery of care, whether it's through HCBS or, or other um, you know, methods. So for example, at Gillette, we really take a both and approach to advocacy. So we, we do federal level work, we do state level work, and we also actually do local work. Uh, with you know city councils and uh, county commissioners and, and the like. But on the state level, what we're working on right now that I think could be applicable in other states depending on their regulation. In Minnesota, if you are a parent of a child with a disability, you can qualify for 40 hours of paid PCA services, which is, is great. A lot of our families use that. It's, it's super helpful. But what we actually discovered um, through our social work team actually, is that if you are a family with two kids <laughs> with a disability, you still only qualify for 40 hours of paid uh, PCA hours. So if both parents want to provide care for their two children with disabilities, they're not able to, to get that very needed funding for their family. So what we're working on now on the state level and our legislative session in Minnesota is wrapping up in, a, in about three weeks, hopefully. So check back with me if this passed, we feel like it, it has a good shot, knock on wood, but we're working to get that cap removed um, on the state level because we feel it's it's super important for our patients. So I, I feel like, you know, given kind of the um, challenges on the federal level, looking at state approaches to improving care is, is another way of thinking about this. You know, obviously the funding aspect of this will always be a problem. Um, without federal action, but um, there are ways I think you can make incremental changes on the state level too. Um, thank you very much, Andrea. I really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone's um, contributions. I think you know there's some good questions that are popping up in our um, Q and A, and um, so so one of them that has really come up is. And I'll just ask Andrea this question, then we could follow through because this notion of support is really great. Do you know of other states that are have that kind of um, those kind of resources available to um, families? Um, and is there any opportunity to have sort of a federal um, a federal role in this, uh, either incentives for states or a mandate for states? Um, to be able to um, make some changes to allow sort of paid caregiving for children? It's tricky. I mean, through the Medicaid program, the states have a lot of autonomy on what they wanna, what services they wanna provide. Um, the federal government can sort of incentivize um, or provide guidance to the states. Um, for example, through what's called an 1115 waiver program, which is established under the Affordable Care Act allows for Medicaid page, or Medicaid programs to, um, it's like a pilot program almost, to try different things. The federal government can incentivize that and say, you know, <laughs> we're providing funding for 10 states under the 1115 waiver program to do, you know, whatever. Um, that's what, what, that's what comes to mind for me. I don't know of other states that do this type of, um, PCA service payment. I'm sure there are others, but I, I'm just not sure which ones they are. Yeah, thank you. You know, I think uh, for our audience, uh, it's always tricky with uh, trying to um, change up uh, Medicaid rules. And there's always a tension between having sort of federal minimums and state options and figuring out ways to get best practices from the states uh, at, a, at scale. Um, so, and it's always hard to mandate that states do things um, beyond sort of a, a basic level. Um, again, it's money and resources and it's challenging. Um, anyone, I wanted to uh, 
there's another question that I, I'd gotten, but I wanna encourage people to put your questions into the Q&A. We have a few minutes left. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, one of the questions uh, that's come up is, uh, there's a lot of discussion in the, in the healthcare field and in feel other fields more generally about the objectives of, of um, addressing health disparities um, and um, meeting the objectives of health equity. And I'm wondering in the HCBS area, you know, what are we seeing? And I just throw this to our panelists to see um, what kinds of initiatives are they seeing in, in those areas to help um, address health equity for uh, patients with uh, uh, individuals with disabilities? I, I just wanted to say, and, and just to chime in on what Andrea was saying on uh, the CMS pilot projects, the 1115 waiver pilot projects, they can be very interesting and CMS will always release when they've approved a pilot project. There is one in North Carolina on the social determinants of health that people are keeping an eye on. Yep. Um, I'm not an expert in this area at all, so I'm gonna put a period right there just to mention that it exists. <laughs> but, but it's one, Andrea, you might be interested in looking at. Um, another question that's come up um, too, and then I, I think I'll do a round with our panelists again for closing comments, but um, another question popped up about, you know, are there organizations that um, advocate at the state level across multiple states um, that are focused on a, a sort of a paid model for parent caregivers? Um, you know, I know there were some, I, I know from my past background in Medicaid, there were some um, early programs to um, allow payments to families under a sort of tighter budget limit, but I, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, where those are today. Um, does any, you know, anyone on the panel focused on what's really, what are good organizations that can help with state advocacy? Um, I know that the Alzheimer's Association is one of those organizations that has been advocating for caregiver support. Um, my mom passed away from Alzheimer's last year, and my dad uh, was the primary caregiver for her um, until she ended up in a in a memory care facility, um, but even still, he visited her, would visit her five or seven days a week um, at that facility. Uh, and he, he, along with the Alzheimer's Association, have been advocating for caregiver support. I'm sure there, I know I've met with several others, but that one in particular jumps out at me as, as one of those organizations that is advocating for that. Yeah, they're real, there's a real interest in finding ways to include family members and uh, close loved ones in in the models of care for, for seniors, for aging at home, but also for people with disabilities. So um, there's some movement going forward. Um, and, uh, and so to answer the, the person's question, um, you know, I think maybe take a look at some of the Alzheimer's Association's materials because it's, they're sort of looking at the same uh, issues about how do you get paid caregivers um, to help out paid caregivers that you can use family members for. Um, could I, I, gonna, I could add one. There's a national, yeah, organiz ahead. there's a national organization, um, called Arch Respite, um, that focuses on respite, but it is, uh, they're very active and I have a lot of respect for them. So there, that might be something that, um, the audience would be interested in looking at. Also, the ARC might be working on this. Um, I know we work really closely with the ARC of Minnesota. Um, and, you know, obviously they have partners across across the country and every state. Um, well, I'm going to do a final round of our three panelists. Um, you know, of course, I don't know if we've really answered the question from the crystal ball about what next. I think the summary I'm hearing is that it's unlikely there's going to be a, um, the kind of funding and resources we had hoped for um, with these issues, but there's an enormous amount of activity and there's an enormous amount of activity at the, at the state level as well. But I'll, I'll do a quick round um, before we close out. So Kate, any sort of parting thoughts 
on think, these questions? I think we had a two year experiment and uh, what worked and what didn't work and lots of creativity and lots of insights and lots of throwing things against the wall and seeing if it would stick. And we can't let that go by without actually capturing what worked, what didn't work and building it into the system because there was a lot of good stuff that happened that we don't want to have get lost. Uh, Andrea, any closing thoughts for our panel, for our audience? Yeah, um, you know, I totally agree with you, Kate. This was kind of a two-year incubator <laughs> project that we all <laughs> involuntarily participated in with the pandemic. Um, I would say, you know, as we think about the future of healthcare, the future of HCBS and other supports, one thing I would just put to the group as you you know, talk with legislators or other partners in the community, and you, you might already be doing this, but really, when you think about health equity, framing it in a way that is inclusive of people with disabilities, what we have found in our work, um, you know, in, in the community and, and, and otherwise, is that there are so many great conversations right now on health equity and trying to figure out solutions to move it forward. The challenge that I've come across is that people with disabilities have been completely left out of that equation a lot of times. And it's 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 really frustrating, um, but um, I think staying the course and kind of providing that education and you know constantly reminding people that people with disabilities need to be included um, is something that, that we all can do to sort of strengthen the support uh, for the services that that many of you provide and that places like Gillette provide as well. Um, thank you, Andrea. And Craig, do you have um, do you have some other parting thoughts for our panel? I mean, for our audience. Um, I just want to thank you all for for again for inviting me and um, for taking part in this uh, this annual meeting. Um, your involvement here means that you're willing to be engaged. And that's a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, without hearing from you and hearing your stories, hearing your experiences, lawmakers like Congressman Cohen and, and his colleagues don't know, um, you know, what what other people are experiencing. So, um, if you are frustrated by a policy, contact your state senator, your state representative, your U.S. your congressman, your senator, whoever it is that um controls that policy or could make changes to it and let them know um we're constantly looking for bill ideas um and ways to make things better so um one way to, one way that we can make things better is, is to hear from you um i also did want to mention that um the with the passage of the big infrastructure package there's a lot of money that is going to go to help accessibility um and uh, um for community and for community projects that can make public transit more accessible um uh, make buildings more accessible and make um it may, uh, just make it easier for people with disabilities to to get around so um there's another good piece of news something that, that that's happened um under this administration um and that congressman cohen is proud that he voted for um but again just thank you again and and you know reach out to your legislators and share your stories because it's it's knowing your experiences that can help guide uh policy um and i, I really want to thank the panelists um i'll share one of my own parting observations um i spent about 11 years as a budget analyst for congress earlier in my career so one of the things i found most interesting about the the funding initiatives for home and community based services um, was that it, it was really the first time it got framed up as sort of a negotiating chip in a broader budget bill in a in a very big um, high profile uh, budget bill and um, it was part of a package of healthcare proposals that um, were that are likely to pop back up again because they had a lot of bipartisan support. Um, and I would also say the home and community-based services, um, just generally, I'm not saying the amounts, but the theme 
um, also had bipartisan interest and support. And so to me, even though this current um, movement has stalled out and may not come back this year, my observation from watching these budget cycles over time is that now when, a, when the next large healthcare bill comes up, there's almost like a placeholder that's gonna be there for home and community-based services and long-term care and Medicaid. And so um, that's my note of optimism I wanted to end this panel on from my experience as a budget analyst is that um, we're now at the table with these kind of issues. Whereas before it was never, it was always a little add on at the end just to make one member happy. Now it's a real core aspect of a legislative bill. So um, I think the future will um, offer um, needed improvements in this area to get the resources we need to direct service providers, caregivers, um, and individuals with disabilities. Um, so really wanted to thank the panel and thank you everyone who stayed with us for the hour and asked great questions and um, thank you. So I'll send it back to Anita. Thanks, Jean, and thank you to the entire panel. And, and this is going to be a, an interesting year again in Washington, I guess. And um, I think your panel helped to offer us a guide to where things might be headed, even though we don't have the answers. So thanks to all of you for being with us today. A reminder that the, there will be a brief survey that will pop up in your browser at the end of the conference um, today. I enjoyed being your host and thank you so much for joining us. And now to close out our day our, in our 2022 conference is the chair of the United Cerebral Palsy Board of Trustees, Keith Graham. Thank Keith. you, Anita. And thank you to everyone who's uh, participated and been part of our conference the last two days. I wanna thank our panelists and speakers, uh, not only today, but yesterday as well. I trust that they've provided lots of information and possible resources for the work that you need and the interest you have related to United Cerebral Palsy and serving all those with uh, intellectual and other de developmental disabilities. As we close our conference, I wanna thank the entire team at UCP who worked to put this together. There are many hours that go into coordinating and, and timing an event, particularly a virtual event now for the second year but that event has allowed us to open it up to so many others uh, to reach a broader uh, base of uh, people and, and, and throughout the disability community to share our conference with. I wanna thank our sponsors for their generous support, especially our premier sponsor, Waymo. If you were here yesterday, you got to see a video as we started of the uh, driverless car that they're working diligently to provide. It was very fun to watch the video and the interest. And I've also had the chance to hear from someone who took one of those rides personally uh, and the challenge of relinquishing but enjoying what's out there for the future of uh, driverless uh, transportation to open up the world to everyone. And again, again, events like this cannot happen without our sponsors. I want to thank the leaders, staffs, and volunteers at all of our affiliates throughout the United States and Canada for their efforts, especially in the past two years. We mentioned yesterday the efforts they've had to undertake uh, and being on the front line, uh, essentially frontline workers in this pandemic. And their ways they've done many things, big and small, to support individuals, families, and the communities. And to say that they've faced an unusual amount of challenges would be an understatement, yet they've continued to rise to meet those challenges each and every day uh, and never missing the goal ahead of them. It's also important with that that we thank volunteers, many of who are probably part of our conference the last two days. Those volunteers support not only UCP's efforts at the national level, but in the 30 states and the provinces where we currently have affiliates. Just to give you an idea of how valuable your contributions are, uh, the independent sector in the Do Good Institute research indicates that the value of one of your hours, one hour is about $30, and that's an increase over last year. And I'm never surprised, but always welcome the fact that generosity of time and resources has always been critical and met with uh, being brought to the communities that we serve. Uh, to quote the Independent Institute, volunteers in the United States hold up the foundation of civil society. They help their neighbors, serve their communities and provide their expertise. No matter what kind of volunteer work they do, they're contributing in valuable ways. I thank all of our affiliate leaders and community leaders. I think that they can all attest to that. 
And last but not least, I want to thank you, our audience, for joining us these past two days and supporting United Cerebral Palsy in the work we do. We mentioned yesterday as we began, our website, ucp.org, is a great place to find additional information about United Cerebral Palsy. And if you'd like, there's an opportunity and a place that you can give either to UCP National or reach out and learn more about and support our affiliates. Both would appreciate the opportunity to receive your support in all that we do. Your presence today is the reason we exist. Thank you and may you have a great rest of the week. We look forward to seeing you at our 2023 annual conference, uh, live in person or maybe in a hybrid uh, through this virtual environment. Thank you.